Hello and welcome to a Talmud Israeli production. Today we'll review the highlights of this week's course of Daf Yomi study, Masechet Kiddushin, pages 28 through 34, Chavchet through Lamed Dalet. 28. Dvar Torah Ma'ot Konot. According to one opinion, at least, under Torah law, money, cash, has the ability to acquire movable items. Umatam Amru Meshicha Kona. So if that's the case, why under rabbinic law was there a decree made that you require Meshicha pulling near to you, physically drawing near to you, the metatalin, the movable items, and that money alone will be insufficient to affect the transaction? Well, it's a rabbinic decree, lest someone say, your grain burned down in the silo or in the attic. In other words, what happens if someone has a large stock of grain, supply of grain and sells it and takes the cash, but the buyer did not come to possess, physically possess the grain. It's still in the attic or in the silo. And then there was a fire. And what happens? The, uh, the seller says, listen, it's yours now that it burned. It's your loss. I get to keep the cash. There's a tremendous unfairness in that. Moreover, it could be done maliciously and deliberately burn something down after the fact. So to prevent these scenarios, the sages enacted Meshicha that the acquirer of movable items has to bring it near to them. It cannot be just that cash alone affected the transaction. 29. Tan What happens if a father has uh, an obligation upon himself to redeem his son, which is a standard obligation, and also to redeem himself because his own parents, years back, did not do so. Maybe they grew up in Soviet Russia, there was no religion, and they failed to do it, so now he has an obligation vis-a-vis -vis himself and his own kid. Who comes first? Who kodem libno? According to one opinion, he has priority over his own child. That he'll use his, his, he'll expend his limited resources if he only has enough money to redeem one person, who redeem himself rather than his kid. Rabbi Yehuda, Omer Beno Kodmo, Shizem Mitzvah Tual Aviv, Shizem Mitzvah Beno Alav, whereas Rabbi Yehuda says, no, no, he'll redeem his son rather than himself, because the obligation to redeem his son is the primary thing that is incumbent upon him, whereas the redemption of his own self was really incumbent upon his father. So since the, uh, the main focus of a man's uh, redemptive monies is vis-a-vis -vis his child, do that first if you have limited resources. Daf Lamed, third. Amar Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi. If you teach your grandson Torah, it's like you received it at Mount Sinai. Or actually, some people explain the Gemara to mean it's as if the grandchild received it at Har Sinai. What's the biblical basis for this interpretation? Shinamar, as it says in the Torah, you shall teach them to your children's children. And an adjacent verse says, The day which you stood before God at Horeb at Mount Sinai. So there's a connection between teaching second generation removed, grandchildren, Torah, and the revelation at Mount Sinai. The approach that says that it's like the grandkid received it at Mount Sinai makes more sense to me because the grandchild is now receiving religious wisdom from an, an elderly figure, someone with a long gray beard and looks like they were from the ancient times. And if you, if you receive Torah only from someone who's close in age to you, it might seem almost uh, insignificant. But if it's from someone who's much older, it has antiquity to it. It's like you received the Torah from the, the, the olden times from Mount Sinai. Lamed Aleph, 31. Amar Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Aser la'adam shi'alech arba'amet bekoma zekufa. Person is forbidden to go four cubits uh, with an erect posture. In other words, we should not be standing tall uh, as we're out there in the public thoroughfare. Shinema malokal arts kvodo, as it says, that the whole world belongs to God, to the glory of God. And we should not be uh, strutting around the world as though we own the place. So to speak, Rav Huna lo maski arba amet belagilei rosh. Rav Huna wouldn't go four cubits without a with, with an uncovered head. Uh, why not? Because you have to have reverence for the Almighty. Amar shchina lamal meroshi. The divine presence is above my head. Therefore, I have to cover it. Lamed bet thirty two. Even according to the perspective that says that a patriarch, a leader of the Jewish people, the Nasi, who foregoes, who waves the honor due to him, the honor is waived and we can treat him less reverentially. Uh, 
Still, Melech Shemachal Kvodin Kvodomachal, if a king tries to waive the honor due to him, the honor is not waived, that he has no right and no ability to uh, tell people to treat him in a more collegial fashion. Rather, he must always be treated reverentially. Why is this the case? Shenemar, some tasim alecha melech. You shall place a king above you. Shetema to alecha, that his uh, awe shall be upon you at all times and never be compromised. Lamed Gimel, 33. Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar Omer. Minayin lezakin shleatriach. How do we know that when an elder is being given respect. They say, You're supposed to stand up for the elderly and give them respect. How do we know that an elder is not supposed to abuse the system, take advantage of it, and get a lot of kavod? But rather, they're supposed to avoid burdening uh, the general public. That even the elder has to fear God and not abuse his privileges as recorded in the Torah. Amrabai, Naketinan, the Makiv So we have a tradition that if you're an elder who walks in a circuitous fashion away from the people to get from point A to point B, in order to avoid burdening them with the obligation to stand up in honor of the elder, that elder will live a long life. And I think that the elders would much rather live a long life, have a few extra years of, on this earth, than to get some fleeting kavod of a people standing up out of their chairs. Lamed Dalit, 34. So, positive time-bound commandments, the women are exempt. How do we know the women are exempt? So the primary case is that of tefillin, phylacteries. Just as in the case of tefillin, the women are exempt. So too, in all cases of positive time-bound commandments, the women are going to be exempt. But as for tefillin, Although it's the classic example, where do we derive that law from? How do we even know women are exempt from tefillin? Gamalami Talmud Torah. Well, that itself is derived from the law of Talmud Torah, where although women have an obligation to learn uh, to be able to perform the mitzvot and not to fail in their religious responsibilities, the women don't have an affirmative obligation to study Torah in the abstract. So since they're exempt from that, they're exempt from tefillin. Tefillin is the classic case of Zman Grama. Women are exempt from positive time-bound commandments. In what regard is tefillin a positive time-bound commandment? The answer is we don't wear tefillin at night. We don't wear tefillin on Shabbat. Everyone have a great week.